Well, good evening, everybody. This is Saturday Night Live. It is Saturday, the 18th, a pre-Christmas show tonight for everybody here. And remember, it's not Christmas until Hans Gruber falls from the top of Nakatomi Plaza. I'd like to welcome everybody in here today. Rick Norman, Erica Tomat is here, Ashley, Jane Meyer, Andrea Gutierrez. Dave K, Jordy Gordon, Todd Gibbs, a whole bunch of you guys. Welcome to uh, Real News Live. It's great to have everybody here tonight. And of course, as always, I'm here with my special guest tonight, Dr. Brooks Agnew from somewhere in North Carolina. Say hello, Brooks. Hello, everyone. Pre-Merry Christmas. And Candace Whitelight from somewhere in the middle of nowhere, Montana. Candace, how are you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm doing well, and uh, Merry Christmas, and also a very happy uh, cold full moon. Oh, yeah, it's a full moon tonight. Well, cool, cool. Yeah, very, very nice. Happy cold full moon to everybody, and it is, uh, I'm sure, cold there. It's cold here, and it's Seattle, which is really usually very temperate. Well, tonight, I am drinking, what are you drinking, everybody, tonight? I am drinking another Red Hook ESB in a can. I'm still working on that case. Brooks has got his favorite, a Coors Light. Way to go, Brooks. Candace, what are you drinking tonight? Uh, I'm doing something a little different. My green tea is a chai green tea with some wonderful almond eggnog in it. Uh, so I'm oh. celebrating. Oh, a little almond eggnog. Any rum in that eggnog? Or what do you put, <laughs> what do you put in eggnog? I've never had the guts to drink it. I I don't uh, do alcohol, so it's just the uh, eggnog itself, which is is very tasty, and and uh, mm -hmm. I'm enjoying myself here. So, Cuba Cuba Libre sangria, uh, sip of sunshine, some bourbon. It looks like we have on the list. Wow. Okay. Well, everybody, uh, this would be a Seahawks, you know, thing, but they're not playing tomorrow. Because, Brooks, of the ridiculous, idiotic NFL COVID rules, the COVID rules. I'm going to turn the chat overlay off for a second while we focus on you. Uh, I, I want to get your take on this. To me, this is absolute nonsense. The rules are that you have to have two negative tests after you test positive. I think at least 48 hours before the game, before you're allowed to play, whether you have symptoms or not, Two Seahawks players showed up with symptoms, and about 15 of uh, the L.A. Rams did. So they delayed the game until Tuesday. Instead of just, oh, you know, the Rams are only going to play with 35 guys instead of 53 guys or 60 guys or whatever it is they have on the roster. Well, it's 53, but 47 active. Uh, it seems to me like they're trying to help the Rams here. And it's also stupid because none of this is necessary. Is it? Is any of this nonsense necessary, Brooks? No, and I I keep telling people stop getting tested, and uh, what'll happen is the uh, outbreak will go away. Yeah, because the PCR tests are generating a whole bunch of false positives, and they've been trying for over two years now to drum into our heads that uh, testing positive is is equivalent to death. When hardly yeah. anybody's being hospitalized. Uh, the people that are mostly being hospitalized are the people that are vaccinated, and they're having very severe problems. Myocarditis, they're, ha they're having a trouble getting over the flu and staying over the flu because their immune systems have been so degraded by the chemicals that they're pumping under their skin. Mm hmm mm hmm um, so, uh, you know, and again, I got my hydroxychloroquine this last week, Brooks. I know a lot of other people have been getting it. When, can you um, tell us a little bit more about how to pick up a safe and effective treatment? For yes, of course. You go to my website, brooksagnew.com. And if you go right to the top, you'll see a link in the menu that says store. And if you click on the store link, it will take you to my store. And halfway down the store is a button that says, click on this button for the Ivermectin special report. Uh, and if you click on that, it will take you to a page where you can purchase Ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine with no prescription. It will come straight from the pharmacy to you. And this is totally legal because these are both FDA approved medications for human use. And it is legal for any American to order prescriptions from a foreign pharmacy for their own personal use. 
That's correct. That's correct. And if you had any doubts, you click right here and it shows you where the uh, National Institutes of Health has approved ivermectin for treatment. Yeah, it's um, kind of funny because the first one they recommend is remdesivir. Yeah. But look at all the side effects. Yeah. <laughs> Kidney failure, liver failure, toxemia. I mean, it's unbelievable. That stuff will kill you. I and noticed, you they, yeah, I noticed they put an interferon now, too. And then ivermectin, you know, no side effects. Right, so. right. Uh, we have now crossed over the 4 billion mark for ivermectin. 4 billion doses have been sent out, and there have been 28, 28 side effects wow. out of 4 billion. Wow. Not that, you know, we haven't sent that many out. Of course, I wouldn't be here tonight if we had. But we, have saved, we are saving thousands of lives here, and I don't know anyone else in the United States that's offering this at least offering it at the price that we're offering it. Because if you go to get this filled with your doctor, it's going to cost you 350 bucks if, if they prescribe it. Yeah. They're not going to prescribe it even if you're sick and they're darn sure not going to prescribe it if you're not sick. And also I did get a prescription, but then the pharmacist refused to fill it in case I was going to use it for COVID. So uh, believe me, uh, if there is an Asara, if there is a reset and I have a lot of money, there's a couple of pharmacists that are going to be sued out of their jobs when this is all over with because uh, I'm not standing for that. that. Yeah. Well, you'll notice up there at the top some red letters. Unfortunately, we tried for three, almost four months to sell into Canada and we lost about 25% of the orders. The Canadian mail system stole about one out of four of our orders and so we finally had to stop sending to Canada. Now, we're going to find a way we're going to find a way to smuggle it into Canada. <laughs> we're, we're, we are going to find Careful. a way. So, yes. you know, stay after it and uh, we'll we'll save lives no matter what. And we again, we'd like to thank TV's Blake Wally for that excellent little Christmassy introduction. Blake also posted something today that absolutely I found hilarious. I pledge allegiance to the flag and it's Pfizer and it's all the soccer players clutching their chests. It's really not funny. It's actually tragic, but it is a point well made. Did you see the all the videos of athletes face planting? Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a lot. Of gosh. Them. Yeah, I know. It's it's quite awful. It's quite awful. And, um, you know, again, it's funny because reading Seahawks Twitter, you know, all the all the idiots that are part of the mainstream media, they're all, oh, you know, the Seahawks did the right thing with all their masks and all that. And, and it's like, well, if they had, if they did the right thing with their masks, how come two of their players got COVID this week and their vaccinations? It's obvious it's the boosters that give it to them, that gave them the disease. But, Candace, it's like talking to a brick wall. I mean, these people are hopeless. And I honestly think, again, I, I do not know. We're going to talk about this in a minute. But I do not know what the good guys are waiting for because you've reached everybody you're going to reach. There, are, These people are brick walls. They're just, they're, they're just completely, they're completely nuts. No matter what you put in front of them, they will not understand what's going on. I talked to a friend of mine today, yesterday in California, and he said, well, with this vaccine, we really dodged a bullet. I said, you didn't dodge the bullet. You shot it straight into your heart. Yep. Yeah, that's that's a division point that we're really having to deal with right now is understanding that it's truly the vaccine is what is the pandemic. Yeah. And this is going to penetrate people in every phase of their life. There's not going to be any way that they're going to get out of this alive. They're either going to be affected directly with this vaccine and then they're going to become uh, spike protein producers mm -hmm. and uh, they will yep that's exactly the dynamic that now is coming forward that people are ending up with that are associating with people that are vaccinated and they're ending up getting sick with some very odd symptoms that really are about them becoming a part of this spike protein um, infection, which is acting much like what you would have if you were infected with parasites. Mm -hmm. Now, some people think of them as like an alien sort of substance, but in actuality, it is about science and it's about a chemistry 
that has uh, been uh, exposed as being uh, graphite hydroxy um, hydroxyquine, which is a a kind of combination of uh, elements that come through uh, from the manufacturer of the vaccines that are RNA, um, and they do take over your your passive immunity system, and they create a um, problem for you long into the future that is going to be having to be dealt with uh, through um, your uh, growth rate, your health in every aspect, your, your immunity system, your fertility, yes, women's problems, you name it. Way, and uh, uh, Baby Snakeheads, you bring up a good point. There's a rumor that was put out on Telegram that the FDA and the USPS are teaming up and they're going to start snagging ivermectin shipments out of the mail. Mm -hmm. Let me mm -hmm. tell you something. That is total 100% bullshit. The U.S. Post Office is the oldest institution in the United States. It's 375 years old. No one, no one can open your mail except you without a warrant. And these are plain packages. There is no way... Anybody in the post office is going to open your mail until it gets to you. Believe me, that is a total rumor. None of our U.S. shipments have been seized. None of them have been opened. Canadian is a different story. They are absolute outlaws. Well, it's a communist dictatorship. I mean, Canada is under a communist, Justin Castro, the bastard son of Fidel Castro, and it's just a communist dictatorship. It, it right. basically was when I lived up there in the 90s. So, yeah. Well, I have something to contribute to this thing about Canada because, of course, I've had horses for many years. And one of the uh, controlled pharmaceutical substances, particularly in the area of uh, Ontario, um, which is basically the seat of the government um, in the Canadian provinces, um, that they outlawed ivermectin as a horse dewormer. In other words, it could only be given through a prescription by a veterinarian. So they've controlled this for 30 years. I mean, it's not a matter of them just all of a sudden going like, you know, oh, it's bad because people are using it for, you know, something other than worming horses. No, they've had a, a stopper on this for many years. I purchased a horse from Ontario that I bought in uh, Br British Columbia that actually was not a, a good doer, they said, you know, but I paid a good piece of money for her. She was a Canadian horse, very kind of rare, and it's their national horse. And I was importing them into the United States and making a good profit. Well, this one mare was you know, a dear, dear horse. She was trained for carriage driving, and that's what I was into. And I took her to events and stuff. And Eventually, having had her for a couple of years, she colicked, and I took her down to uh, Washington State University, which is the uh, veterinary college, and they did surgery on her in order to get her taken care of as far as her impaction, which is what she had that was wrong with her. When they were in uh, looking at her intestinal tract, which it's quite uh, extensive in terms of trying to do that surgery, um, and they told me afterwards that she had a whole bunch of little pearls throughout her, in, you know, abdomen. And they, and I said, well, what's that all about? And they said, well, uh, when these worms that are basically rid from a horse's body by ivermectin are, um, uh, the worms become very, uh, you know, they're called small strongets. Mm -hmm. is what the technical name is. And when they go into the intestinal tract, they basically bore through the, the walls of the intestine and go into the abdomen. Now, this is a stage of growth for them that they're, it's called in, in, uh, cyst or in, in sight. What is it? Uh, um, it's their, their stage of development that they go through. And as they pass through those walls, they leave a little shell behind, and that's the cyst that they kind of pop out of. So she was full of them, right? 
And they, I said, well, how did, does a horse get that? And they explained it to me. And I said, well, she came from Canada, you know. Well, that's the case. These old farmers that had these horses never gave their horses the pace because they would have had to have gotten a prescription and had the vet come out and it was just too expensive. So she ended up uh, a couple of years later having another bout of, because it damages them. I mean, it just destroys everything. So I got to thinking about it once and when this whole thing about, the, you know, COVID came out and that ivermectin was involved, I thought, what have they done? They've created something that basically is boring through our intestines, our walls of our arteries, our heart, and, and it's going to places and creating blood clots, this vaccine. And I just went, put two and two together. And I said, well, I'll be darned. That's the reason is because it's acting like a parasite. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so here we are now, two years into this, and people are still going like, well, Lottie Dog's going to help. No, it isn't helping. It is hurting. And people have to get to the point where they're going to say, no more. It's over. I'm not going to do this anymore. And get a clue phone. And you can explain that story as best as you can. That happened to me back in the early days of the 2000s, many years ago, and also apply this logic. They knew about this vaccine back in 2015. Yeah. Fauci and his group, they had it all planned. They had done this and they tested it and they had done all the exploration of the entire chemical, physiological, everything that's behind it. And what did they do? They went forward with it at the moment that they needed when they had reduced everybody to their lowest form of, of understanding. And they attacked us when we were down. If, if people could, you know, try to put this together, I think we'd be a better place. So. Yeah. Well, if, a lot of people were put in jail. We'd be a better place to do it. Right, uh, right. No Oracle. Nobody can tell you how much to take. You're 117 pounds. There are charts online. You can go look weight charts for taking ivermectin. Um, so you got to dose yourself, but you do need to do your homework. And it's pretty easy to find, find, uh, find that information. So, well, I can tell you with the horse ivermectin, it's one to one. In other words, if you get a tube of the paste, it's for 1,250 pound horse. You take as much. It, there's lines on the on the plunger, and if you are weigh 117 pounds, you take you know 117 pounds worth. It's 1.87 percent. That's what all ivermectin is out there. The rest of it is all fillers, um, and that is the dosage. So. To take that to the bank in terms of any well, milligram yeah. dosage, it's Again, one to one. Go, go to the weight charts. You, these, you're getting 12 milligram pills from Brooks, so go to the that's go to dose the dose for 150 charts. pounds. Yeah, so. Brooks, we lost your camera. Did your camera crap out on you, or you're just uh, you're really? just a B, you're just a BA sitting? There. I must have there clicked on the wrong thing. There you are. Okay, now you're back. All right. Yeah. Sorry about that. I, no, I was right. in the chat and then re minimized the chat and clicked the camera instead. All right. It's okay. But well, we're fine. Erin Meekin is a little late, but she is here. Well, hi, Erin. Um, okay. So, you know, again, I, I continue to say that until an NFL player drops dead on the field from the, the vaccine, with a heart condition, nothing's going to change. And it doesn't seem to ha be happening. Brooks, I was kind of wondering, why do you think soccer players are being so adversely affected by the heart effects of the vaccines and NFL players aren't? Is it the short bursts don't put quite the strain on the heart or what's going uh, on? That's what I'm thinking, that the soccer player is running miles and a football player runs like 30 yards and then he yeah. goes to the bench or, you know, has a huddle. So I'm not saying their heart's not, you know, pumping because they're they weigh twice as much as a soccer player. But, uh, you know, uh, that it could be that a lot of NFL players are not vaxxed. They uh, yeah, 
a lot of NFL players are are black and blacks as a community are not taking this vaccine. They've been down this road before. Right. So they're they're resisting it. They're uh, they're uh, I'm not saying they're game in the system, but I'm saying that they've been down this vaccine <clears throat> before. They're game. I have. I know a lot because a lot work for me and about 6% of them are vaccinated. The rest are saying, no, we're going to wait and see what happens to all you. Yeah. Let's watch. Let's watch. Let's see what happens to all the white people that take the vaccines. Uh, yeah. I got to tell you my city and my team, they're among the worst, the Seahawks. They're just, they're just, just spewing the propaganda right and left. It's, it's nauseating, very difficult to stay a fan of this team, especially with Pete Carroll at the helm, who just has turned out to be a complete idiot, but, uh, and I'm yeah, not such a great coach anymore either. So, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's really sad to watch. Now I wanted to talk to you guys about something else. I wanted to, uh, let everybody know that I created a new backup Facebook page, um, because I, kind of was tired of not being able to interact with certain people um, on there. And it's just, just going to stay up until I have, um, until I get my, when I get out of jail in like 22 days. Um, but it's uh, Michael Herbert Barra is the name. Yes. Leave that page. Michael Herbert Barra is my, uh, my homepage. And uh, that's what it looks like. It's uh, just some pictures I threw up there. Somebody, people keep saying happy birthday. Cause I listed, Today is my birthday. It's not my birthday, folks, but thank you for the wish, well wishes anyway. I uh, got a few pictures up there. So if you do get a um, an invite for me or you send me an in invite, uh, yeah, I will approve you. And I'm just it's, I'm just going to use it for a couple, couple weeks. Uh, but what is really interesting is that it has been reported that significant amounts of water have been found on the planet Mars. And Mars' massive version of the Canyon is called Valles Marineris. And um, they've done a bunch of observations from uh, a new probe. What's it called? I don't know, but it's got a trace gas orbiter is what they're taught. Friend, a friend instrument. And they found that there's this usually unusually large amount of hydrogen in the colossal Valles Marineris Canyon system. Assuming the hydrogen we see is bound into water molecules, as much as 40% of the near surface material in the region appears to be water and right here smack dab in the middle is where most of it is well this should be familiar to people that have followed my career over the years because 20 years ago richard c hoagland and i wrote a paper called basically the mars tidal model where we basically said that there were two global oceans or two oceans on the globe of mars huge oceans that had a tidal bore back and forth between them, which was Valles Marineris, where you saw the water because the uh, the fact that Mars was in a tidal lock orbital situation with a gigantic planet, which no longer exists, that Mars, in fact, was not a planet, but a moon of planet V, which you can tell from the massive tidal bulges. And the prediction was is that this tidal bore is what carved out Valles Marineris, this huge um car, gash in the side of the planet mars from an ocean that was on uh the, on the east and west sides of the planet it went back and forth and where the two bores met in the middle is this area here where they would crash together and guess what where we told you we said there would be water would be right in here be the best place to look for water right exactly where we said it was 20 years ago is where they have found the water once again i would like to congratulate nasa on catching up to where me and Hoagland were 20 years ago. Guys, any comments on this, Brooks? I mean, Mars was a an Earth. It was like the Earth until this cataclysm destroyed the planet that it orbited. Um, God knows when that happened. Could have been billions of years ago. Could have been millions of years ago. Could have been a couple hundred thousand years ago. Could have been very recent. Hard I so remember you uh, doing that, Mike, uh, when you talked about the... Um, you know, seeing the features for the cities, you know, that mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. when I first got, you know, sort of interested in your books and your mission and, you know, the things you've worked off. I'm, I'm fascinated by Mars. I've, I've been very interested in it for my whole life. Literally, I was told at one point by a psychic person who looked at my, you know, <clears throat> astrological chart and, I'm an Aries, you know, which is ruled by the planet Mars. And, 
And they said, well, you know, it looks to me like you've you've been there before, you know, because I had these memories of a, a vital sort of, you know, interaction with, uh, you know, the Martian uh, star seeds, if you want to put them that way, that came there um, eons ago after the, uh, you know, the two planets in the, that are now the asteroid belt was destroyed because it was during that period of time, theoretically, again, this is, you know, <laughs> in question, but <clears throat> that uh, the uh, destruction of those planets is what blew off the, um, the atmosphere that was a part of Mars and left it covered with dust. And, um, you know, it being called the red planet is because it was, had a lot of iron in it. Yeah. It's the oxidation, and iron the oxidation. oxidation yeah. Soil. So yeah. it's, uh, you know, it, it is probably now coming out that, uh, there was a civilization on Venus as well that, uh, kind of went through, a similar situation that, uh, you know, as the sun is uh, getting um, decreased in its uh, its uh, wavelength and its its strength as it's going into the yellow sun phase, yellow star, um, that it is going to be again. Venus will be inhabitable because. Um, during the period that Mars was vital was when, again, it was more of a livable um, ring that they call the, what, the Goldilocks zone, you know? Yeah, that is, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, we theorized that there were three habitable Earth-like worlds in the solar system, Venus, Earth, and, and Mars, which was a moon of, of planet V. So you had an inner Earth, an outer Earth, and a middle Earth. Yes, middle Earth, yes, that's correct. And um, we're the only one left. And and if yeah. you look at if you look at Venus, there's a if you look at the radar um, the radar stuff that was done to, on the surface mapping, there's a huge gash around about one third of the planet. You can see something came in at an angle and just tore right through it, vaporized the atmosphere, turned it into an unlivable hell instantly, practically. So uh, and that was debris from this planet that exploded that Mars used to orbit. And of course, Mars, if you look at all the craters and everything spattered all over, it took the brunt of the of the pain. Yes, Christian Helwig, I was supposed to be on that episode of Shatner's The Unexplained last night, but they called me back at the last minute and canceled when they found out I was a patriot and I'm no longer I'm no longer allowed on Prometheus TV shows, I think, because it's it's one of three possible things but i'm pretty sure that's the reason so it's a it's a shame but oh well thanks for all the tv facetime guys okay so um now uh phil godlowski our our buddy did a uh did a show tonight did a live stream which i you know usually find kind of interesting phil's a lot of phil's ideas are a little bit nuts um you know uh, the flat earth and the Holocaust didn't happen and all that. I really wish he hadn't gone there, but I think his Intel connections are pretty good. And he's been very consistent with confirming things that Jen has talked about. But um, one of the things he said tonight is that he said he got a contact from his high Q ish Intel source who um, told him basically uh, three words before four words, the stage is set is what he said. And then he said that he followed up with some other Anons that he knew, people that he says were involved in the early formative years of, of the Q posts and things like that. And um, the one that he got back, the feedback he got back is that Trump is reinstated as president in January. Now, I personally don't know how the stage can be set on December 18th, 2021. And it's a minimum of two weeks before we see Trump back visibly in charge again. I keep hearing it's way sooner than that. Uh, it should have never, he should never have left power in my opinion, but Hey, I'm not running the show. So I don't know. I just wanted to get any, any comments, any thoughts on some of these, these Intel leaks. Candace, I guess we'll start with you since you're the one who has probably the most to say about it. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, as long as it's considered an Intel leak, it's got to be sort of staged so that there's question marks around it. But right. um, I believe that, that Trump is still our, 
uh, commander in chief. Yeah. I think that he is um, working right now on um, the truth social, which they feel that they have to bring forward um, simultaneously really with uh, this movement that will, you know, signal that the, um, that we're done with the, you know, deep state and that uh, everything's been swept aside and they're creating all this drama around everything that are just basically distractions. But, um, you know, the uh, person I follow, obviously, that has had the most to say about some of this is, um, is sticking with the original notion that, um, you know, that um, that we still have a strong patriot community, even though it sure seems like there's uh, quite a few out there that are making a lot of trouble in terms of, you know, various people. And I myself have had to, you know, sort of uh, act against uh, certain people that, um, you know, don't seem to be on the right side of things, uh, but that we have you know, generally in an idea that's going on that uh, this is going to happen fairly soon. It is already underway um, in terms of a lot of the operations we are seeing. Um, the internet is starting to be very affected um, that we have a leak that just happened and it uh, came through as a open source code leak with a flaw that, uh, is in LOG4J, which is a backgrounder for all the computer networks. And um, it happens to be something that is being fought uh, by the very people that we're going against who have really their, it's their last gasp of ability to control us, which is really has to do with the AI. It has to do with the hybrid program. It has to do with the programming of people that have chips embedded in them, um, that as soon as they lose control of the internet, they're going to lose control of all of that particular aspect. So they are throwing everything they can into the wrench in the works to try to create these outages um, that, of course, are going to affect everybody. Uh, they've been working very hard to um, interrupt the supply chain, um, which I am very familiar with because mm -hmm. I'm working right now with UPS. And uh, it sure seems to me that uh, we have stuff entering the system. We're actually successful in terms of deliveries. We're getting stuff to people. But there's still folks that say there's these, you know, high level um, programs that are that are having some major flaws that uh, they're uncovering and having to deal with them uh, through all of the systems, primarily in the bigger cities with uh, not only the, uh, um, the occurrence that we all rely on, which is just connectivity that has to do with the uh, various uh, providers of the internet and of our you know, cell phones and such, but it's all been, uh, you know, separately um, taken over and is now running through mostly fiber optic networks. And then they have Elon Musk on hold right now. He's not able to ship out his Starlink uh, units. There's a lot of people waiting, particularly in the South um, along the corridor for the 33rd parallel here in the uh, 47th parallel um, we have um, a good uh, portion of folks that are hooked up to it so and it is way better speed it's way better service it is rock solid it's what's carrying the gps system now um, so just you know to update people we do have that uh, there's also this uh, this rumor that's going around about uh, Russia that is um, they're attacking or thinking of attacking the Ukraine. Uh, there's a lot of tension over there. There's been threats made. Um, we have a lot of um, military over there right now that are uh, settling in for a, you know, and you hear none of this on the major, you know, MSM yeah. sort of thing. 
Um, so this is, uh, you know, what I have found out from following Monkey Works, which he has a great program three times a week. And he's reported on, you know, these uh, operations. Um, there's been spy planes and spy balloons off the coast of Florida, central Florida, which is exactly where the Truth Social servers are and where the effort has been put in to um, completely recode Facebook. Um, amazingly enough, we actually have that in hand. Uh, so, you know, but again, there's various phases of the internet that people have to kind of find out for themselves who they're connected to, where they're you know, source code is, um, you know, what service they have and where the towers are, because we're going to see more and more outages. It's, it's really a, um, it's the beginning of a lot of changes. So yeah, that's just my update. All right. Um, you know, again, uh, Ashley, Venus, Earth, Mars, for some reason, I can never get Saturn out of my head. I feel like no one talks about it. Maybe there's not much to talk about. No, it, it carries a significant portion of the bulk angular momentum of the solar system, which is what really drives all the physics. And Saturn is very significant because it's the system wide hyperdimensional inwelling point for the energy in or in in this solar system. That's why it has a hexagonal cloud formation around its northern pole for more information read the choice by mike barra an excellent book that will tell you all about saturn and fill in all the holes in your knowledge base okay brooks trump in january trump monday as far as i'm concerned you know um and if the stage is set which i believe that is his legitimate intel what are you waiting for? Why not just uh, why not just roll the tanks? Well, it's clear that we have a presidency in exile, and uh, people will eventually discover that. But really, there are two online battle plans, and there are two offline battle plans. The two offline battle plans started first. It started with uh, Miller, uh, uh, Watnick, and Patel in mm -hmm. uh, January of two thousand and seventeen. Actually, in November is right after the, the election were put in place, but devolution was begun in January, and uh, it's uh, full blown now. All the military assets are in place, spread out, decentralized. The other offline war that's going on is inside the Pentagon. It's inside the Pentagon. It's a, and it's an intelligence war. It's a war between in the inside the General Corps. And Garrison's guerrillas are trying to go through the Pentagon and clean out all the patriots. As you can see, we lost 109 Marines this week. We lost uh, most of the F-22 pilots. They're, they're, this is all under the guise of the, the vaccine mandate, but it has to do more with ideological differences between these military personnel and the differences uh, in the, in the uh, leadership in their general corps. The other uh, are the two online, and these came along later, but it, the foundations were laid in the beginning, but now they're being implemented. The first of the online battle plans is with a new social media network. This is a vital because during the presidency and even during the, the campaign for the presidency in 2016, Trump used Twitter, he used Facebook, he used uh, this effectively. Uh, I, I, I met with Jake Sullivan. I spoke with him for hours on this. They were brilliant in putting this together. They caught the Democrats totally flat footed, but not in 2020. In 2020, they pulled ballots R us out of the bag. They printed a bunch of counterfeit ballots. They stored them in warehouses. They shut down six states at the same time on the same night. The AI figured out the number of ballots that they needed and they trucked them in and fed them into the system. And that's how they won. They won through cheat by mail. So this social media is key because the instant it goes live, Trump will have a hundred million subscribers, a hundred million. And it's so powerful. It's so vital that Devin Nunez resigned as a ranking member on the committee, the, the House Intelligence Committee, mm -hmm. Devin Nunez resigned in order to become CEO of this social media company. That's how powerful it is. It gives President Trump in exile 
direct conduit to his uh, followers without being censored. That is huge, huge. The second online uh, battle plan has to do with online banking. One of the things that we have seen unfold over the last uh, 16 months is PayPal is in serious trouble. They're in serious financial trouble. They have dumped millions of patriots. They've seized their accounts, seized their money. They can't do business in PayPal. They thought that if they would cut off their ability to do business online, that they would disembowel the patriot movement. Not true. Not true. There is a new online bank coming. I can't tell you who the players are, but I can tell you there's a new online bank coming that's going to be patriot friendly and it is going to be glutted with cash. Tons of cash. Because well, isn't, um, patriots are the people that buy stuff. They're the ones yeah, that pay. Isn't that part of what the service Trump is going to offer as well is on yes. online financial transactions, right? Exactly. Yeah, this has to do with our um, Steve Mnuchin, you know? Yes, and these two battle plans, communication look, and money. Yep. And uh, look at the $50 bills, folks, and the 20s are now, they have gold embedded in them. And yes. the 50s and the, are signed by Steven Mnuchin. And there's a huge shortage of cash. You remember how 1928 happened? Mm -hmm. 1928 happened because they cut off the money supply. They choked the money supply down. And what happened is the banks closed and did what's called a, uh, a bail-in. Instead of a bail-out where the taxpayers bail out the banks, they simply just take the depositor's money and call it their own. It's a bail-in, and it's going to happen. But that's why these two battle plans are so vital because he'll have direct communication and he'll be able to move money to candidates instantly all over the country. It is vital. This is how Trump is going to come out of exile. And it may actually happen in January. Hmm. Well, it should happen. Jen, Jen told us January 2nd and 3rd is the Nasara announcement. You can't have the Nasara announcement, I don't believe, as long as Biden is still in charge. So no. what's the speculation on Joe Biden? Uh, I know the 15th was speculated. Some people were saying, oh, he would resign by the 15th. There is rumors that paperwork was actually signed on the 14th to remove him. And everything we're saying now is seeing now is, is kind of a joke. There was the video uh, from yesterday where I don't know if you guys saw this. Should I show you this video? Let me see if I can find this video. There was a video from yesterday which was um, at the uh, White House Visitors Center in Washington, D.C. Candace, did you see this or hear about it? Well, you know, I saw um, I saw the one that Biden went to in Kentucky. Yeah, where he was molesting little kids again. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, uh, this guy is not he's not the same person he doesn't walk like him he doesn't look like him his ears are coming off his mask is hanging out his forehead looks different no he's gone biden's gone i mean i'm i'm pretty convinced that these rumors are actually true that what has been installed is the um you know what we have been waiting for which of course is uh our our uh upper level um partners that uh, have have really, you know, are the ones that are flipping the switches in D.C. So this is All about as best you can do. All yeah. it will take is a DNA test to prove that the guy that's bumbling and stumbling and acting like a fool is not Biden. Hmm. Yeah. OK, well, let me go to hang on, guys. Um, I'm trying to pull this up. And, and this is interesting because it's it, it's again um, it's again symbolic. Uh, By the way, Glenn brings up a good point in the chat room. He says DC's been a ghost town for quite a while. That's true. I yeah, watched, but aren't, aren't they going to just blame all that on COVID? You know, well, it's, it's, yeah, it's, but I watched it. Jen Psaki talking with the presidential seal behind her, and while she's talking to the reporter. A jet flies overhead, a loud jet. Yeah, which she actually is has to stop for a second and say, Oh, hang on, there's a jet flying overhead. Well, no, most people don't catch that. There ain't no jets flying over the White House. 
ever. Yeah. Yep. Um, hang on. I'm still. Yeah, looking. it's called the brown zone. You know, it's an area that there's no flights that um, are supposed to enter the airspace unless they're either military or um, approved of by, you know, the, um, uh, but the airport there. So it's, uh, yeah, it is odd. It's all very odd and it all makes no sense in terms of what they've been showing us, which is primarily, as we have said before, green screen stuff that is done off site. And um, there oh, were some people the other day that talked about the uh, underground under the White House as to having, you know, the bunkers down there that are actually now being run by um, our, our higher level uh, tunnel teams and our uh, security, you know. So it's um, it, there's a, a lot of speculation, but. I think we're in a good position right now for going through some of these uh, these uh, primary shifts that, uh, you know, I've seen them in everything from the Schumann to the uh, uh, electromagnetic field. A uh, lot of information out there about what this is really going to look like in the future. Yeah. Um, again, you know, it, it's one of these things where guys, uh, unfortunately, I didn't put it up on uh, on a on a channel that I have access to. I could show you guys. I can show you guys on Telegram, but for some reason, Telegram doesn't show. But let me let me do a quick screen grab. This is from Nancy Drew's video. I assure you, this is correct because I have the video of it at home. But when she went, she heard a rumor that at the official White House Visitor Center that there was no Joe Biden. Uh, posted there. And when she went there and looked at the list of the presidents on the wall, yeah, the last president listed is Donald Trump. And it says 1917 to open. And there is no Joe Biden almost a year after his fake inauguration. So it's kind of interesting that officially in, you know, the White House uh, visitor Center, there is no President Biden. It's still President Trump. I, that I find kind of interesting. Brooks got yeah, it, it, right? is, it is a presidency in exile, though. And I'm not exactly sure why, you know, it's that way. I really don't. I mean, if, it, if he's not the president, he's not the president, damn it. But, um, you know, I guess it's well, to avoid war. It's an interregnum. War with we're, we're in an interregnum. Nobody really knows who the president is because Joe Biden was not elected. He doesn't have the nuclear codes. Trump still has the nuclear code. So there's kind of he's kind of doing some of the executive duties, the ceremonial duties. Trump is doing all the real stuff. And, you know, it's disputed because nobody has settled yet on what standards we're going to use to decide who the president is. I think that's what's going on. It's, it's an interregnum. Well, the, there's this other element about that it. I had heard about a little while ago, but it has to do with the Winter White House and the fact that um, the only thing they didn't have there that would have been a clear cut, okay, we're not running things in D.C. anymore. We're now running them out of Central Florida underneath Mar-a-Lago, you know, um, that uh, they didn't have a, a decent computer system. They didn't have the servers there so that they could run all the intelligence and everything that they need to have capacity for, which um, has been, you know, been preempted because, of course, our Internet is all over the country with various server farms. There's a big one that's uh, south of Utah that everybody knows about uh, because Google controlled that up until about six months ago when Google actually capitulated and became a part of the White Hats. So I can tell you that from my research, that is true. We actually have Google on our side now. Um, and that was because they didn't want to lose the GPS coordination between, you know, maps and Google Earth and all the things that they provide. It's a big cash cow for them. So they couldn't give that up. So that was a part of the, um, you know, the, the deals that they've done behind the scenes that basically are, are leading to the setup, which is now capable 
because, and I, I do know this for a fact, and Juan may get a little upset, but um, he was a part of this in terms of moving uh, a set of servers across the country to that very location where, um, you know, they are now available to Trump Social, which is what they're putting all of the code onto all the 6G code that is going to be running basically our entire social networks. And I believe that there's enough servers there to, um, you know, to, to put the Department of Treasury, the Department of Defense, um, and several other military operations control, um, you know, networks on those kind of um, facilities. So that's going to switch um, at the same time that all of this, you know, plays through where we can actually turn them off. And this is what we're waiting for. This will be the big moment. And of course, EBS is going to then be become uh, available. Um, many of us that are, you know, in the rural areas will continue with our uh, general sort of way of life. Uh, not a lot is going to happen out here, but in the cities, there may be some major disruptions with some of the players that like in, you know, Seattle is a big one um, that are, are controlled by, um, and I hate to say it, but um, it's because the CCP came in and basically commandeered a lot of the telecom over there. And they did that during the 80s and 90s um, because I worked in that you know, field and, and actually uh, could tell you when they came in, <laughs> when they took it over, because I used to work with uh, several of the uh, telephone companies that uh, ran the switches and everything. And of course, you know, Microsoft, duh, you know, it's from mm -hmm. Washington State. Um, and they were also instrumental in aligning themselves with intellectual property through, you know, their programs with China. And I'm sure Brooks is aware of that in terms of how much money was lost um, to China during those years uh, in with trillion. intellectual property. Yeah. 70,000 corporations were closed. Not 7,000, yeah. 70,000 corporations were closed during the Obama administration. I helped put some of that equipment on boats to ship it to China. Chinese money was everywhere. It still yeah. is. Um, Dave, to answer this question, I, I told you this last week. I, I wish you would listen. Um, they're going to issue new phones for the new system. They're calling them Q phones right now. Phil Godlowski claims to have one. That's how he receives his intel. And it's going to operate completely different than any system that exists now. It's not going to be just like this brick in your hand with a cute picture of your kitty on it. It's going to be a completely new technology that they've been developing for quite some time. And it's going to be orders of magnitude beyond what we have today in today's cell phones. Am I wrong, Candace? It's going well, to be a it's a... The... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, somebody's asking about 6G, and I, I think there's a misunderstanding because 6G isn't an, a, affiliated with any of the telecoms. Um, 6G is military, and it's a, um, it's a light beam technology. In other words, it isn't the agitated, right. you know, shit, the, the copper that we have had to put up with. Um, it is a quick technology to set up. In fact, the military has done it in countries that have been decimated by, and Haiti is a good example, where they can take a truck in, put up a tower, and within 30 minutes can set up a cell phone network. Because it's, again, it's if you have to look into it, look into Starlink. Unfortunately, they've taken down everything, but there is some information out there still that I can find um, about this particular system. It's fiber optic cable that has been put in under our very noses in most cities across the country. So ask around, ask your local, tell, go down there and visit and say, what, you know, show me your, your control circumstance here. Where are you getting the internet? 
because uh, throughout Montana, you can see it on the side of the road and it will say, you know, caution, micro, micro cable, you know, um, and it is, is uh, perfectly functional and we've been dealing with it for years, but they have, um, you know, now they have created um, a, a fiber optic cable that actually can be um, stepped down. They do it with a rare earth um, mineral called erbium and it is embedded or they call it um, that it is uh, doped into these fiber optic cables and it actually literally can take a light um, light wave and move it into a radio wave. That's called stepping down because what you're doing is you're taking a very high frequency um, signal and then you're moving it into a lower frequency so you can actually feed it into our hardwired computer systems. So, you know, that is in particular something that I've done a lot of research about and I'm really, my cat wants to participate in this conversation. Yeah. So um, he's, he's really an interesting cat. The, um, so it's, it's important that folks kind of do a little bit of research because our cell phones, 5G is a total con and it, it doesn't exist in terms of the cell phones. It's a sales pitch, okay? Oh yeah, I get, you know, 5G, it's what's coming. 5G requires a unit that is put on a telephone pole and it only goes about 800 to 1,000 feet. It is not something they can put up on a cell tower and send out as a signal. It's highly agitated, but a very short distance. So it has to go to an interpretation center or a, you know, Wi-Fi portal, which, of course, if you lived in a city like Wuhan, for example, that had 5G that was set up, they were had these units on these telephone poles all over the town. But in Our order business. to get the signal, you it's had to building. have it. Yeah. And it killed everybody there. I mean, it's like. Duh. So this whole thing has been organized again with the help of, unfortunately, the CCP um, and also all of these technicians that developed this magnetized graphene vaccine that was based on an, a bioweapon. You know, I mean, a, again, we're going to have to get to the point where we understand that we were totally conned. So um, anyway, so it is uh, the case that it'll be simple. <laughs> Not me. I'm a pure blood. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. You're muted, Mike. You're muted. We can't hear you. By the way, ladies, when it comes to reproduction, I have completely unvaccinated sperm available. That's Brooks, right. Um, as are you, Brooks, I'm sure. Um World Economic Forum is what WEF stands for. Brooks, yeah. uh, why don't you explain some of those things? We have a problem. I don't know why Restream will not allow my guests to type in the chat, but apparently it won't. So Brooks sends me stuff in private chat, and then I put it over here in the chat for him. Why don't you go on with the point you wanted to make about uh, Nisera or whatever else you want to talk about? Now we got we got a well, period here about 10 minutes. A lot of people have been sucked into this, and I, I spoke to one at a conference who was just hopeful that Nassar was going to pay off all his credit card debt. I said, what are you talking about? He said, oh, yeah, I'm buried in like $90,000 of the credit card debt, and they're going to forgive it all. I said, and you're going to get to keep all the stuff that you bought with the credit cards. And he got this look on his face like, well, well yeah. And I said, you know, the bank relies on the debt that they have with you as an asset. It's the bank's asset. They use it to leverage. It's called a derivative. There's about $650 trillion of derivatives for U.S. banks. That's the interest that they're going to earn on all the debt that they're carrying. That's the value of the banks. When Nassara happens and it's all being driven, not by patriots, but by the World Economic Forum, when they forgive this debt, people don't get nothing. 
They just get the stuff they already have. They're stealing it. The main thing Nasara does is it breaks the banks. It bankrupts the banks. The banks have no assets. They're out of business overnight. And then there's only one bank. And that's the World Economic Forum. And they're going to reissue a digital global currency. And all the accounts will be in one bank under one control. It's not a good thing. That's why you need to have your cash turned into silver. Do what the wealthy are doing. That residual cash that you have in your bank that rolls over each month that you don't use, 25% of it better be turned into hard assets. Land, gold, silver. Do it. Because if you don't, you're gonna, what's going to happen is exactly what PayPal did to all of us. One day they just said, we're parting ways. And I said, okay, well, then give me my money back. Oh, no, 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 no. We're going to keep all your money until next June, and we'll decide what you get back. One day you're buying groceries, and the next day you're homeless. The money you have in the bank belongs to the bank. Convert it to assets. That's what the world yeah, is. And that's what you should be doing. It is true. When you deposit something in a bank, you are deposing yourself of the money and the bank claims that it's theirs. Uh, however, Brooks, I fundamentally disagree with everything else you said, except buy silver, which is a good idea. Buy silver, buy cryptos, invest in foreign currencies. I don't think that's what Nasera is going to be. Um, I don't, I, I just, it, it's not going to happen that way. But everybody, we, you know, we all have our bets here. Everybody has their opinions. We shall wait and see. What's I don't going trust on. anybody. I don't, people, I don't, yeah, trust I know you don't. And I don't, anybody. I don't blame you. I'm just going to say, I, you know, the purpose is to forgive all the illegal debt that has been level, you know, but basically they've made us all debt slaves for the last uh, 70, 80, 100 years since the 1930, 90 years now, since the Gold Act of 1933. And they've tried to make us debt slaves without telling us that it was actually all our of our money, all of our money in the first place. The banks didn't ever have money. It's our money out of our accounts at the Federal Reserve. But uh, okay, guys, it's roundtable time. Let's uh, just take five minutes. Brooks, you can riff on anything you want for five minutes. You go first. Oh, wow. I've never done a round table before. I don't even know where to start. All right. Well, um, pick a subject. You, know, you can talk about more about this if you want. But it, right the, the thing is, we're getting ready to start a new year. So psychologically, it's a good time for people to kind of renew. Like, what am I going to do for the next year? So what I recommend, and I teach a class on this, but what I recommend is all of you go out and buy a high-quality journal. And then take the first page in that journal and write down everything you want to do, everything you want to have, everything you want to accomplish in the next 12 months. Then assign a priority to it, A, B, C, or D, like all the A things I'm definitely going to do as soon as I get disposable money, B and then C and then D, and then assign a price to it out on the right-hand side and start setting your targets for 2022. Pray about it. Meditate on it. Think on it. The next couple of weeks gives you a good chance to write all those things down. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. If you don't write it down in this book, it has about a 10% chance of ever happening. If you write it down in this book, it has a 90% chance of happening. Don't let 2022 take you off guard. Everything we do will eventually affect the universe. So do it on purpose. Do it your way. Take with purpose. control right. of your life. Right. That's great. And that is true. Nine, it has a 90% chance of happening if you write it down. Good for you. That's great. great That's story. right. And put all the detail in you can. Color, mm -hmm. size, model, uh, uh, the class you want to take, what you expect to learn, what you expect to do with what you learn out of that class, computer class, crochet class, whatever it is. Do something. Be something. You are in total control of your life condition. I'm if just... You uh, like where you, if you don't like where you are, it's your fault. Now get started. Yeah, I'm just drawing a quick picture here of a black Porsche Cayman S. Uh, That's what I'm right talking now. about. I'm doing that. So, uh, Candice, go ahead. You got five minutes to talk about anything you want. 
Let's talk about the Schumann resonance. Let's do that. <laughs> that happens to be one of my specialities. Um, right now, what we're going through is a period of um, what I believe is a reset that uh, is really in training us to look elsewhere for what it is we do every day, which is think. Um, you know, regardless of really what your life is like, what really is important to you is what is it within the distance between your fingertips if you hold your your hands out straight, um, you know, to your body. And, um, you know, that area of, of the world for each one of us is considered our resonance or our frequency. Each of us have our own particular frequency. Um, and each of us have control over that space that we're in. So um, we can connect directly to God, which I think is the, the really luscious part of all of this, is that we are learning now that all these systems that have been set up to control us are absolutely, completely, um, you know, we can ignore them. We don't have to participate because it is when they get close to you, you can create a, a vision for yourself, much like what Brooks talked about in your book, but create it in your mind. Um, what we have in the, between our ears is probably has more capacity than any one computer system that anybody has had any experience with. And uh, we are capable of, of absolutely getting to a point where we can enter what's called flow state which is where we are dropping out the agitation and we're coming into a, a uh, frequency that's around eight hertz to uh, 13 hertz. Um, and that is called alpha brainwave state. And that's where we have a really uh, these uh, abilities to become um, directly connected with people uh, with things, with animals, with plants, whatever you want to be connected with, where we really can become other things. Um, and that is a state of being that is very divine, actually. And uh, that then is coupled with what's called a gamma brainwave state, which is above our beta brainwave state, which is the agitated state of being that they try to keep us in. That's where all our devices run. That's where the TV runs. Mm -hmm. That's where everything is that is uh, able to penetrate us and take over our minds. And this is shown on the Schumann with many different uh, spikes and peaks and amplitudes that basically um, really try to... Uh, tell us that our main connection should be our groundedness with the earth and then our connection through our bodies, through our minds to the cosmos. We are a part of this circuit. We create it. We have this ability to come together as humankind mm -hmm. and to demand that we are listened to, that we take control. It's in the constitution. It's in our minds, and it should be in our very being. And that is where, you know, b becoming a part of a group and other people locally is uh, very primary to folks understanding that. And that, um, you know, I have a group on Frequency of the Earth, which is on Facebook. I've been able to sustain it for quite a while now. Tons of resources um, you can, there's a search bar, you can look at it and, uh, to become a member, all you have to do is ask to be in, answer one question that you're going to follow the rules. It is a private group and I don't allow other people, but the administrators from posting. And so we have a tight control over it. And it's, it's very interesting, all the research I've done, particularly on brain, brainwave state on the Taurus fields on the um, physics, the new physics that uh, really have been proposed by Juan Osavin. Um, he's done a lot of research. He's asked me to do this group. And this is where I have really 
started to shine. I'm one of the few people out there that are actually putting together these ideas uh, scientifically, as well as, um, you know, what I would call ethereally or spiritually, which I think we get into that on many discussions. And we have a very vital group. Um, and I really uh, recommend it. So that's my five minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Oh, um, Brooks. Uh, okay. I, I completely missed that because I was busy doing something else. But Brooks says one ounce, five outs, and 10 ounce bars are available for about 26 dollars per ounce which i think is very underpriced uh silver is being artificially shorted by morgan stanley that has about uh, uh anywhere from 300 to 3000 short contracts for every ounce of silver it has in its vaults which has the largest silver vaults in the world and they can't afford to let the price go up because they have the silver oversold so badly but the uh, silver has to go up because it's being consumed about as fast as we're mining it. Uh, the average Tesla has about 20 pounds of silver in it. Mm -hmm. uh, solar panels have silver in it. All the CRTs, the screens that we're using, and computers have silver in them. Plus, silver is in jewelry, and silver is fantastic for conducting electricity, way better than gold. And uh, it is... Um, a little more difficult to mine than gold. In fact, there's so much gold in the United States in placer mines that if they mined it, it would make gold fall through the floor. Gold would only be worth about three, four hundred dollars an ounce because there's so much gold in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. There's mountains in, in Africa that are literally made of gold. I mean, they're just gold, almost all of them. So, all right. right. Um, mine, is, my little thing that I wanted to share before we go on to the entertainment portion is actually kind of entertaining. Uh, guys, this is the uh, Democrat candidate for governor against Ron DeSantis just posted on her, on her, uh, on her uh, Twitter page tonight. Uh, her and a tank top. twice. What's that? I would vote twice. Yeah, I vote two times with her uh, empty Coors beer can. And, and she posted up here, uh, by the way, uh, I read all replies. I, I hope you don't read mine, Nikki, because because they're, they're pretty fucking amusing. I may say that. But she's getting completely... <laughs> Roasted, uh, roasted in here, you know. Yeah, all these, all these people. Did you pick up the litter on the ground next year? Did you leave the empty beer cans on the grass? Not very environmentally friendly, you know. Uh, not as offensive or condescending at all. Do you have an OnlyFans page or something? Because you know what, I would, I would subscribe for at least a month to your OnlyFans because you got some bazookas there, lady. That's all I'll say for you. I mean. They're so crazy. They literally think that this is what's going to win them Florida. I don't know. And how old is this Budweiser cap with the cut in it? It's like, wow. So anyway, that's your governor. At least it's better than the black dude that was found naked on the floor in his own puke with a with his gay lover in the hotel room. Kill him. Yeah. Is that the guy The guy who lost to DeSantis? I think so. Yeah, he was the, the mayor of, I think, what, Tallahassee or something. He ran for, uh, ran for yeah. governor. Yeah, ended up so, in a cheap hotel. Woke up with a sore yeah, ass and a so quarter in his hand. There is a picture out there, but I don't want to show it. Uh, Nick, Nikki's the one to reach out to Pasco County. I mean, it's just they're just roasting her alive. But Nikki, thank you for that. Uh, I will put your picture to good use later on this evening. All right, guys. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say. Did I say that? It's Saturday night. I can say that. Brooks, <laughs> you came up with. Hey, top five as we move to the entertainment portion oh, of the show. I did, didn't I? Did what you was it? The top five because we don't have to do one, but uh, if we do, it's on you. So what's it going to be? Ah, uh, well, I sent it to you an email. What was it? It was top five. Uh, it, it was. Uh, it was kind of weak. It was. It was. <laughs> it was. It was musicals. You wanted to do movies. Oh yeah, musicals. top five musicals. Right, right, right. That's right. That's top what five you wanted to do. Movies. And we're going to use a very loose definition of what is a, a musical basically it's any movie with a musical or dance number in it it's gonna be what okay okay 
<laughs> so we'll, we'll use it very loose, make it very loose. Brooks, what is your top five all time? Oh my gosh. It could be, it can have a Christmas theme if you want. If, well, if you I, okay. Okay. Then, uh, then my f- number, uh, five is going to be uh Jesus Christ superstar. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, any particular reason or just because you well, like the music? You know, or? To me, uh, you know, for a kid I hate musicals in, too, in, but... in the Air Force uh, that had lost his way, it was the same message to a different beat, uh, a different rhythm, a different kind of music. It reached a different kind of crowd. And it's funny because I watched Ted Neely over the years do this on tour, this live. And I, I watched a recording of him doing it. I think it was like... 2003 or something he's got to be getting old he's like close to 70 years old and he hit the high notes in the garden of gethsemane and it was just so moving the audience was just mesmerized by the entire performance so i think it's the same christmas message or at least easter message to a uh, to a different rhythm. So Jesus Christ Superstar was my uh, All right. is my number All five right. musical. And Christian, I don't really think Team America World Police is a musical. It's a puppet movie, but it's not a musical. Not a, <laughs> wow, Stephanie's got all kind. Stephanie's got two musicals in here. She's got My Fair Lady. She's got uh, she's got Grease. Okay, Candice, I hate to put you on the spot, but have you got a musical for us of your top five musical films of all time? Oh gosh, you know, there's actually quite a few. I I'm sitting here going through where yeah. what would be number five and four and three. Um, I am going to throw out all that jazz as number five. Oh, I yeah. love that movie. I mean, great. it was a great yeah, it was it was great acting. Um, I'll never forget. You know, it's showtime. Yeah, <laughs> I had some great. Used him for years. Bob Fosse was uh, mm-hmm. uh, quite a character. Um, the choreography, I think, uh, made it, made the movie. It wasn't that the music was, you know, was good, but it was the fact that they, all of them were a part of that theater thing. And, uh, you know, I skirted that for a while before I got into film production because, it was it's a big deal in Seattle, you know, there's all sorts of theaters down there, the rep and everything else. And it's a really strong community. And they did several musicals there. And they actually did all that jazz back in the 80s. And, um, you know, it it was the actors and stuff. There were some really great guys that were, you know, really good performers that were there. And they worked primarily in the theater, but they got a lot of uh, film jobs that you know because i mean and commercials uh that uh you know became quite powerful over the years but uh anyway so that's my number five no, that's the great and there's a lot of great movies in the 70s it's amazing how many great movies there were in the 70s considering what a terrible decade it was for everything else um but there's a line in there where his girlfriend is complaining to him. She caught him cheating again. And she, he says, but aren't I good to you? And she goes, yeah, Bob, you're really, really good to me. You're a really generous guy. I just wish you weren't so damn generous with your cock. <laughs> and he says, great line. I'm going to use that line. That killed me. I've never forgotten that line for some reason. Hilarious. All right. Um, okay. My, I would go with something like White Christmas. But if you watch White Christmas, it's a really weird movie. I mean, it's weird. Movies in it the is 40s weird. Were- we're it weird. Is. Oh, we're going to put on a dance party and sing really awful songs and do terrible dance numbers for our general from the army because he helped us kill so many Germans. You know, it's weird. It's really weird. So I can't go there. So I want to go with the Prince film, Purple Rain. Great music. Great musical numbers. Yeah. Time, yeah. Prince. Purple Rain at the end. Actually, a lot of that song was ad lib, the version of the song that actually became the song on the album. Great, great out, uh, great movie, hilarious in some uh, aspects, and really enjoyed the music. So I'm going to go with Purple Rain as my number five. Brooks, your number four musical film of all time. Uh, I, I think it's, I'm going to go along the same lines. The song remains the same. Well, that's a concert movie. Yeah. Okay. But same thing, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Led, Led Zeppelin. Yeah. It was really, really cool. It was a if you never saw Led Zeppelin in concert, and I have seen them live in concert. There's a very special chemistry because they don't rehearse. 
that's what was what was so strange about the Led Zeppelin chemistry is they don't actually get together and rehearse for months before they go on the road. They just yeah. fly into the same city, go on stage, and do their thing. And it's 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 magical. It's chemical. So yep. the song remains the same. Was really a a trip through the Led Zeppelin chemical experience on stage. And and I'm just going to tell you that most of the film, ladies, is shot right into Robert Plant's crotch. And no, that's not all him. Okay. <laughs> uh, Candice, your number four musical <laughs> film of all time. Uh, I'm going to skirt with one that. Um is a was a uh, done by a guy uh tim burton and tim burton i got to meet once and he is truly a crazy man um yeah. he did the night before christmas, before christmas yeah which was probably one of the darkest fantasy world imaginary characters you know stop motion which uh again was the about the best they could do in the 90s. Um, Will Vinton, of course, with his, uh, you know, the raisins and the, the you know, um, that whole thing was uh, really the format for doing this kind of, um, you know, monumental movie. But it took a lot of effort. It was actually a legend that uh, goes back to some of his other films. You know, he did one um, about the, Halloween, you know, and then he did the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, I believe, that were also just monumental in terms of his vision of what fantasy, real life, you know, all this combination stuff was really as dark as he could make it. So that's going to be my number four. Okay, interesting stuff. The Wizard of Oz was a good choice. The Wizard of Oz. In fact, Deborah, I'm going to take The Wizard of Oz as my number four. I was going to just cave in and go with White Christmas because everybody sings I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. But I'm going to go with The Wizard of Oz. We are off to see The Wizard. And its sequel, of course, made in the late 19, early 1970s, Zardoz. So anyway, uh, if you don't know, guys, if you've ever watched the movie Zardoz, it's the Wizard of Oz. That's where the Zardoz comes from. Okay. Um, Brooks, you're number three. You know, a lot of people don't uh, realize that it was it was the musical that really made Hollywood dominate filmmaking. Yeah. You know, from the 30s and 40s and 50s, it was the musical. It was the musical talent. To be able to sing and to dance at the same time on film and have it come across and entertain was really, really something. So I'm going to go with one of the greatest musicals of all time. I saw it, the premiere, at Grauman's Chinese. It was shown in two parts. There was an intermission in the middle of it. And I saw it with my parents. My parents were big Hollywoodites in those days. And that was The Sound of Music. It changed musicals forever. Julie Andrews and the quality of the yep. sound. Tech, yeah, I think it was done in Panavision, which was yeah the, the big movie. beautiful yeah it was amazing yeah 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 absolutely absolutely the sound of music. Candice, your number three musical film of all time. Well, since we're in that venue of you know life altering, um, you know this goes a little before um, sound of music. Same era, but uh, singing in the rain. And, uh, you know, that was that that really that element of Hollywood that really, as you put it, was the at the top of the heap. It it was the highest form of entertainment and it it drew in the most box office. And it also made the biggest stars, you know, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, Mm -hmm. who uh, famously said, you know, um, they, they danced together as a couple. Ginger Rogers said, well, I, you know, uh, it's great to be seen with a good dance partner, but I have to do it backwards and in four inch heels. <laughs> so, you know, the woman part of this was very primary to the, uh, the whole studio system that became, you know, really made many, many women that, uh, you know, could sing and dance and, and, uh, 
at the same time, um, you know, very famous. So I'm going to go with Singing in the Rain, which is one of my favorite scenes of him with the rain pouring down and dancing. You know, it just was fantastic. And they did that in one take. Gene Kelly did, did that scene in one take. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Yep. There's no cut. You're right. I think there's no cuts in that. It's pretty amazing stuff. So, um, yeah, you know, I don't know how anybody actually considered. I feel bad for my parents that that was entertainment. I mean, tap dancing. I just, I hate, I hate that stuff, but they are classics and you do have to occasionally just uh, say that it, it, it was, uh, it was an, you know, it was a period of time and, and, you know, uh, yeah, Elvis musicals, there aren't very many musicals being made these days. So it's not, it's not easy to, to have more modern up to date ones, but I have one from the eighties. I'm going to call Top Gun a musical because his music was so critically important to the energy in that film. You had Danger Zone with Kenny Loggins. You had, uh, I don't know, some other songs. You had uh, Mighty Wings by Cheap Trick at the end, which is one of, which is a Giorgio Moroder song, but just rips by Cheap Trick. Absolutely rips. Great energy. You had F-14 Tomcats flying around shooting down F-5 uh, fighters, which they were calling MiG-29s, which was pretty stupid. But the rest of it was awesome. Great movie. The scene where Tom Hanks flips off the Ruski pilot is really cool. I'm going to call Top Gun my number three favorite musical film of all time. Brooks, your number two favorite musical film. Uh, oh. Well, I could, I could go along the same lines. Music that uh, didn't really belong. I mean, nobody actually sang in the movie, but they did great music in it, and oh, it was oh, not... They sang. They sang uh, You've Lost That Love and Feeling in the oh, bar that's scene. Right, that's right, yeah. They, sang. Cruise, yeah. they, they did sing, yep. But this movie had uh, music that did not go with this genre of movie, and that's what made it so interesting. It was a good kids movie. It was a good grown-up movie. It was great acting. It was a good story, and that's it. A Knight's Tale. Okay, yeah, I remember that movie. I, I didn't oh, see it. Oh, that's anymore. a great one. You know who did the, uh, is that's a Hans Zimmer, isn't it? You know? Well, Hans Zimmer and then and then uh, Queen. They had a bunch of Queen songs in it. I mean, yeah, it was, yeah. Just well done. Very nice, yeah. Super nice acting. Uh, a David Bowie song in there. I mean, it was just yeah. well done. Lots of great stuff, yep. Candice, your number two musical film of all time. Oh boy. Um, I wanted to find something more recent than this, but I guess I'll go with my first thought is uh West Side Story. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I, it, right? da, 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 da. yeah, this was, you know, they, they lasted for a long time, you know, all of the, the pieces that were part of this. And it was, um, I can't remember the name of the, the man, very famous um, conductor, composer that did all of these, um, all the songs in it. But anyway, so West Side Story, it was also, you know, it, it had been done several times. And it was a story, of course, as everybody knows, um, of a contemporary version of um, uh, the Juliet. Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, 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 right? So, yeah. So, yeah. West Side that Story. Is, uh... Spielberg just recently remade that, right? Right. Oh, yeah. There's, there's so it's many rough. remakes. Yeah. <laughs> so you could go actually very contemporary with it. So it sucked. It was all timeless. Woke. Yeah. Timeless. Okay. My number two, oh, I, Sondheim, right? I am tempted to go with the Rocky Horror Picture Show. A lot of people have been putting that out there. That one was really funny, uh, bizarre, weird. There were a lot of great numbers in it. Um, if you're drunk. If you're like, yeah. If you're drunk and you like show, show tunes, which I don't. So I'm going to go with and another off the wall pick. Um, I'm going to go with the 1983 film. And why, they're all from the 80s. I wanted to go with Rocky IV because of all the montages. But if you do that, then you've got to say, well, okay, then I guess Team America World Police is also a musical because it had a montage and a musical montage. But I'm going to go with Flash Gordon because yeah, it, was, it, was, it was a dreadful hilariously oh bad campy movie but it had all kinds of great music from queen in it you know flash he'll save every one of us awesome stuff you couldn't really sing along to any of it but it was so full of music had all these great musical bits in it and it had ornelia moody as as the bad princess and so for that reason i am picking flash gordon as my number two musical oh, wow. theme film 
of all time. And wait till you guys hear my number one. Nobody, I don't, I haven't seen anybody guess my number one yet. So, but Brooks, first, uh, you are well, you my thunder there. But it, it, barring that, you got to go with a musical that has lasted and lasted and lasted. It is popular. Uh, the the it's iconic, and that's Greece. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, Greece. Stephanie had Greece on her list earlier. A lot of people like that. Movie. Um, yeah. Um, Olivia Newton John, John Travolta. Travolta. Um, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people. That's like where him. he started, didn't he? I what mean, was that your, was okay. The no, Brinks, he started with Saturday song? Night Live in dancing, but in singing, you're right. It was Greece. Yeah. You should have to list. You should have to list your favorite song from the movies that you pick. Brooks, mm. what, was your what was your favorite song from Greece? Uh, you're the one that I want. <laughs> All right, Brooks. Um, okay, Candace Whitelight, your number one of all time musical. Um, I'm going to give a, a kind of two that I just, I, I know the one that I want to go with, but I, I've got to say an honorable mention to Labyrinth. Um, since you mentioned Bowie, I think that you, you've got to go to something like that because that was so astonishing as far as a story. And of course, the, um, you know, David Bowie, who was a genius and nobody, um, you know, sort of will question that, um, is his presence in that movie was so important. But um, so that's an honorable mention. But I'm going to go with one that is just an all time favorite for me. Uh, Dan Aykroyd um, and uh, Belushi uh, with uh, the Blues Brothers. Oh, the Blues Brothers. Yeah. Blues Brothers. Of course. That, was yeah. that was a great movie. That's a great call. That is a especially yeah. for Saturday Night Live. So Way to go, Candace. Way to go. Oh, man. <laughs> that, was, that was the most amazing music yeah. uh, the act on that stage and that in that old auditorium that they did dan Belushi. oh yeah right yeah. just phenomenal what is it we, we got a cold case of beer a full tank of gas it's dark and we're both wearing sunglasses <laughs> <Let's Yeah. laughs> right. and yeah. we're on a mission from god and we're on a mission, we're on a mission from god, from god. Right. <laughs> Let's get it. it's dark and we're wearing sunglasses yeah yeah <laughs> it is and yeah. Belushi actually did his own stunts and could do his own uh, cartwheels. Yep. So all right. Well, now I guess I'm it comes Belushi. to me. And damn you, Ashley! Curse you, Ashley! Curse you! Curse you! Curse you! You ruined my surprise. You what? absolutely ruined my surprise, Ashley. I was going to go with this, and you completely messed it up. My number one musical film of all time is Showgirls. There is no way around it. Showgirls starring Kyle MacLachlan and Elizabeth Berkley is my absolute number one musical film of all time. Horrible acting, terrible dance numbers, weird, stiff, strange dancing stuff happening in it. It's all about Vegas and it's really, truly dreadful. And hopefully this is not even gonna play. No, it's gonna play. This is the trailer for Showgirls. It's, I'm not even going to put you through it. It's so awful, but, you know, <laughs> you know what? but Elizabeth Berkeley, man, she gave it her all. And I do mean all because Chicago yeah, was pretty good all. too. And, Chicago and, was pretty good. What's that? Chicago was pretty good. I had no Chicago idea. Was not, what was not bad, but, but Kidman, when Kidman can sing, you, you know, when Kyle McLaughlin said he knew showgirls was a disaster, he said, my first day at work, I walk in and I walk past Elizabeth Berkeley's dressing room and she's standing in there completely naked with three production assistants rubbing body makeup all over her. And she turns to me and she says, Oh, good morning, Kyle. How's it going? And he said, that's what I knew. That's what I knew. This film was in trouble. Wow. What a disaster. Uh, Paul Verhoeven was the director. Uh, Milius, I think, was the screenwriter. Should have been something. God knows why it was so awful. But it was just the worst film I've ever seen. But it was musical. It was musical. All right, guys. That wraps it up. Uh, I cannot name a song from Showgirls. 
No, I can't. <laughs> I can't. There were there were some songs in some of the dance numbers, though. There were dance numbers. They were choreographed. There was there was like choreographed dance numbers. Really, seriously. Oh, uh, look at cool. Jules in in the chat room says they did South Pacific. Now there's a musical film. Mm. What was it? I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. What was all the other other songs in that movie? That was crazy. I don't know. I don't. I'm not old enough to remember. That was, well, uh, I, I have another honorable mention too. All right, so, all right go ahead. And one more. It's the producers, and I can oh, remember it, my favorite song, and it's called "Springtime <laughs> for Hitler." <laughs> and Germany, yeah, that was. Uh, <laughs> if you guys don't know what that movie is, it's from the late '60s. It's a musical. It's hilarious. It's a Mel Brooks, Mel Brooks. comedy, and yep. uh, it's about Bob a couple Delby. of producers who figure out the best way to make money is to have a disaster Broadway play. So they make a play of, about Hitler and the, the theme song is springtime for Hitler. I don't think that was the name of the play. I forget what the name of the play was, but yeah, the opening number is springtime for Hitler in Germany, but they did such a great job that it turns out to be a hit anyway, and they lose money. Oh, so. some enchanted yeah. evening. That's right. Well, but the, the shot of the audience, I think that took, you know, the whole, yeah. first part of the film where everybody's it's the entire audience the jaws are dropped i mean they're in yeah. shock because yeah. they're coming on and they're goose stepping and they're saying the oh, springtime for hitler <laughs> and germany and it's like oh god that song, <laughs> it was a moment that, yeah that movie is so old that that teddy bear was brand new when I first started <laughs> as a little kid. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for SNL. Um, I, I don't plan to next Saturday. It's Christmas. I'm not planning on doing it. Who knows? Maybe I'll get lonely on Christmas and <laughs> come on and do uh, do one. I think everybody else is probably going to be with their families and stuff. But if you if you get lonely, lonely if enough of you say, hey, we want to do an SNL, maybe we'll do a little SNL with a glass of champagne or something. To sell. Maybe we will have something to celebrate for Christmas. Maybe we will have some debt forgiveness or Nisara or currency. Well, that's so fair because I have no debt. So what do I get? What's that? I have no uh, debt. You get paid back uh, every bit of interest at a minimum that you paid. And you should get the principal back too, because that was all fraud as well. You get paid back every bit of interest that you've ever paid in your lifetime on any federal reserve um, mortgage, all my mortgage, credit loans. card, all that stuff, your cars, Get, the, get all the interest back in one lump sum. So that's what they're saying, but probably not true. All right, guys. Uh, well, it's probably is true. I'm, I'm, I want to keep everybody bucked up. Uh, I'd like to send my thanks out to Candace Whitelight in Montana, uh, Brooks Agnew in uh, North Carolina, and TV's Blake Wally somewhere east of California for the wonderful introduction. Hope you got to watch tonight, Blake. We love you guys. Merry Christmas. I will be back on Monday with Jen Den. We will talk about everything that's going on in the world. And beyond that, I say just have a really great Sunday at home with your family and your friends. Get ready for Christmas. And uh, and to all great, a good night. And to all a good night. Oh, right. Merry Christmas. And go watch a musical. Go watch a musical. All right.